Welcome to today's webinar, American Urbanist, How William H. White Reshaped Public Life, it's hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, supported by the US EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website at smartgrowth.org that provides information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The Clearinghouse provides information to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of Smart Growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics av available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. We are recording this webinar and will be posting it on our website under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter to learn about our upcoming webinars. The views expressed by the speaker in this webinar are those of the speaker and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the State of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AIC AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is American Urbanist, How William H. White Reshaped Public Life. You can also search for event number 9245929. I would like to acknowledge our webinar partner today, Island Press, and their partnerships manager, Jen Hawes. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and to create solutions to its complex problems. Today, our speaker is journalist Richard Ryan. Richard has written for Time Magazine, People, and many state and regional publications. He launched a nationally acclaimed weekly newspaper, US One, that helped the Princeton Route One corridor become more than an edge city. He now edits an online hyperlocal news site tap into Princeton Community News in New Jersey. American Urbanist, his first book has been reviewed in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and many other publications. Richard serves on Princeton Future, a nonprofit that promotes sustainable urbanism in his hometown. He was raised in upstate New York and majored in English at Princeton. Following his presentation, Richard will answer as many questions as time permits. As always, you can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. And to get started, we will do what we usually do. For those of you who've been with us before, a quick poll to find out where the audience member's in so that we can actually uh, share that with uh, Richard and, and the audience as well. So we'll give you a few minutes um, to respond if you are having trouble uh, responding to this poll, you may need to exit from full screen mode and select your option. And we will just leave this uh, open for a little bit and um, give you an opportunity to respond. Looking forward to hearing from Richard. We've been working closely with him about this one, so um, be interesting to hear his insights. Give you a couple more seconds. So today, 37% of the audience is in the Mid-Atlantic or Northeast, 20% in the West, 19% in the Midwest, including Canada, 18% in the South, including Mexico, and 6% international. With that, I am going to turn it over to Richard. Welcome, Richard. Peter? Uh, it's a little daunting to, to hear all that information about uh, AC, AICP and CNU credits and so on, um, because I'm sure you realize we journalists um, really have no accreditation process whatsoever. Um, but you can get a clue about a writer's credentials by looking at the uh, dust jacket of his book. Um, it's all done very deliberately. Share your screen. Share your screen. Whoops, show my screen, yeah. 
Yeah, are we there now? Yes, we are. All right, thank you very much. Sorry about that. Um, so we look at the dust jacket of, a, of the writer's book and you see uh, it's all done very deliberately. I ignored the part about majoring in English. Uh, and, and for this book, this urbanist book, I emphasize the edge city and the sustainable urbanism uh, and so on. And um, in White's case, um, it really wasn't so easy to, um, to categorize him. Um, even today, I find people aren't sure what discipline he's from. Um, early in his career, he studied how people relate to the institutional and organizational settings surrounding them. Uh, he wrote the best-selling book, The Organization Man. We'll get to that in a sec. Here we go. Yeah, The Organization Man. Um, later, he, he studied how people relate to the physical spaces surrounding them. So his 1988 book uh, was City Rediscovering Center. So what discipline could possibly bring these two fields of study together? Um, and people would ask me that. Was he a, a sociologist? Was he an anthropologist? Um, in one conversation, when I couldn't really give a good answer, I was speaking to a professor at the University of Colorado who, who used White in, in one of her classes. She said, well, what did, he get, what did he get his PhD in? So turn to the book cover. This is the original um, first edition of The Organization Man, first of many editions. It, it's still in print, incidentally. It's uh, recently come out in Chinese. And uh, pardon the battered appearance of it, but if you look closely at the back cover, there you see it. White was born in Westchester. He was educated at Princeton and in the United States Marine Corps, Guadalcanal. Um, so there you have it, real simple and real deliberate on White's part. Um, and um, that's the PhD, Marine Corps at Guadalcanal, or as, about as close as White would ever come to one. Um, there's our PhD student right there. So. Um, this is a long ways from a PhD or, in, or a master's in urban planning, of course. Um, but my goal today is to show you that, that what White learned in the rains really was useful for the rest of his career. And that can, can still be applied today to help planners and, um, and other lay people to address the challenges of the urban landscape, uh, possibly even communicate those ideas better to the, to the general public. Um, the late comedian George Carlin had a comedy routine, some of you may recall, about his favorite oxymorons. Uh, there was friendly fire, an open secret, a non-dairy creamer. And another one that always got a lot of laughs was military intelligence. Uh, hopefully White uh, will demonstrate that military intelligence is not just a comedian's punchline. But first, let me provide a little bit of context. Uh, these are the top 12 students in White's graduating class at St. Andrew's School in Middleton, Delaware. Um, William Hollingsworth White, so he's known as Holly to uh, family and friends and now to his faithful fans, um, is on the right in the, in the row of standees. Um, now, this is the good news. Um, White incidentally was number 10. Um, but the bad news was that this picture actually includes the entire graduating class. So, so White finished 10th out of 12th, not, a, not exactly a, a brilliant academic career in high school. Um, but the headmaster saw something in White. And this is the uh, assessment that he wrote in, in White's college application. Um, brilliant, brilliant boy who can scarcely be classified in the ordinary way. Um, White went on to Princeton, he earned a degree in English, wrote a senior thesis on George Bernard Shaw, and then he went out, he got tail under the depression, he got the kind of job that somebody might take at that point in, in the economic history of the United States. He got a job selling uh, Vicks Vapo Rub in, in the hills of Kentucky. Um, so it was perhaps not a surprising thing that White, even before Pearl Harbor, several months before, uh, would choose to enlist in the in the Marines. Um, and there he is in, in uniform again. Um, but he didn't really learn the nuts and bolts of uh, 
that went into his military PhD uh, in that uniform. He, he learned that um, at Guadalcanal um, in, the, in the fall of, fall and through the early um, year of 1943, fall of 42. Um, and these were observational lessons. And this is White on the ground at Guadalcanal. He's, he's in the center row seated. Um, but among the lessons that he learned um, was, was to gather information um, systematically and, and bring it together centrally. He said, teach your men to restrict themselves to reporting what they see and hear, and not to go on to, into the process of interpreting the implications of it. Um, he talked about um, the control of the information. He says, and he wrote this at the time, as in every intelligence function, it is not the individual report which counts, but it's the mass. See that you control that mass. And that second paragraph is, is that second sentence is important. It's uh, controlling the mass, assessing the, the uh, reliability of the uh, source of information. Um, Another view, this time White is standing on the upper right. Um, Judge people by their capabilities, White advised his fellow Marines, not by their intentions. Uh, and he pointed out, even during the war, that the Japanese had, had sort of judged the United States by its intentions. People said they wanted to remain neutral. Uh, the Japanese sort of en envisioned that this was a decadent society that wouldn't wouldn't care enough to be drawn into a war, particularly in the in the Pacific. Of course, that turned out not to be true. Uh, at one point, right, White wrote during the war, "Human nature being what it is, rare is the person who doesn't secretly feel himself endowed with a profound perception of other people, with instinctively correct hunches as to their probable behavior." in a given set of circumstances. Uh, now this lesson would be reinforced time and again when White got into the study of urban uh, environments. Um, Seagram's Plaza in New York, for example, was de designed by Mies van der Rohe and Philip Johnson, so it wouldn't attract anybody, wouldn't have anybody sitting around those, uh, those reflecting pools. But the people came anyhow. Um, the other, the other lesson pulled out of the battlefields of Guadal Guadalcanal, context is important. Um, at Guadalcanal, one critical part of the context was the terrain. Aerial photos only provided so much information. And uh, just as later it would turn out that studying the ur urban landscape um, would require people to, to get out and really walk around, um, so it was at Guadalcanal. Good, the good maps needed to show the ups and downs of the terrain. Um, so, interestingly, these, these observations about White's experience at the war were not something that he hatched later on and ruminated over over the years and, you know, 30 years later, sitting over a brandy and a cigar, um, reminisced about his days in the military. This, this material was all written during the war um, after White had served at Guadalcanal and did some training in Australia. He returned to Quantico for the last two years of the war and was a uh, was an instructor at the, at the uh, training officer training school at Quantico. And he wrote six long analytical pieces for the Marine Corps Gazette. Um, and, and most of the quotations that I just gave you from, came from those Marine Corps Gazette um, uh, pieces that were written as the war was in process. Um, so he armed with those clippings, he, he looks for a job after the war. He manages to land an incredibly good job with Fortune magazine um, in New York. And Fortune at that time was the second magazine in the, in the Time Inc. empire. It was really coming into its own in the 1940s and 1950s. And of course, you know, we all think of the 50s and we think, well, it's, it's a time when not very much happened. Um, it was the gray flannel suit. Um, there's the novel by that, by that title that came out just a year before White's organization man. And uh, it was dubbed the silent generation. Um, nobody, nobody did too much. Everybody kind of you know, followed, the, followed the leaders and so on. But Fortune magazine was hardly silent. Um, it, was, it was outspoken in a lot of ways. Uh, early in, in White's career, uh, he wrote about business communications. 
And business, business communication was, of course, the source of a lot of the advertising for Fortune magazine at that time. White nonetheless um, dismissed it, at least some of it, as being, and this is a quote, not worth a damn. Um, in that same period of time, in that same article, in fact, he coined the word that we still have today in use, groupthink. Um, now, he defined it as a rationalized conformity, an open articulate philosophy, which holds that group values are not only expedient, but right and good as well. How many times have we, have we heard a meeting end with people um, marveling at the fact that everyone was in, in agreement on our course of action? Must be a good course of action, um, but is that necessarily true? Um, so people were struck by this term. People went to great lengths to try to avoid it. Um, a uh, company in Chicago, Illinois, the Harwald Group, created something called the Group Thinkometer. And the Group Thinkometer was a gadget that a group leader could hold, could have, and, and all the group attendees at the meeting could have little um, buttons that they could put under the table, perhaps, or hide in their hand. And when he would call for an opinion on something, people could voice their opinion. The group leader could see what the group consensus was, but he wouldn't know who the uh, who the people were who voted for it or voted against it. Um, you know, the, the promise here was that this was a way to achieve harmony, and this was an important part of the whole social ethic that White described in the 1950s. Uh, people wanted to achieve harmony. Um, the belief was that a harmonious organization would be more productive. Um, and that was the conventional wisdom. And, and of course, the subtitle of this book is uh, refers to White's unconventional wisdom. And this was one of many cases where White just didn't buy it. Um, he, uh, he said, we are denying that there is or should be a conflict between the individual and the organization. This denial is bad for the organization. It is worse for the, for the individual. So the... Uh, one thing that White worried about was the, the hiring practices. Um, a lot of companies were using psychological tests, tests of really dubious value, um, but which were aimed at trying to find candidates who would best fit into their organization. Um, but White wondered uh, what would happen to exceptional people who were outside the mold. Uh, people like White himself, who uh, his headmaster had, had, had said couldn't be classified in the ordinary, ordinary way. And this, this quote is from an industry trade journal called Personnel. Um, and, it make, and it makes you wonder um, if, if the men of management prefer to have normal personalities, um, what would men of management make of a slightly erratic woman who came into their midst? And uh, there were a few women working, and there was even some at, uh, at Time Incorporated. This time, here's a possibly erratic, slightly erratic woman riding a bicycle up one of the avenues toward Midtown Manhattan. Um, what what would they make of somebody like this? Well, in this case, in this particular case, they would right away, as we recognize Jane Jacobs here, um, who did come to commute to work on a bicycle often. Um, they would they would take notice because they had a formidable uh, intellectual force in their midst. Um, Jane, contrary to some uh, impressions, Jane was uh, an accomplished journalist. She uh, was an experienced writer. She'd taken a deep interest in architecture and planning. Um, and in 1956, but she, but she was still a woman in, in, the, in the field, of course. In 1956, her editor at Architectural Forum, um, Douglas Haskell, was asked to attend a conference on this, quote, new science city planning uh, involved going up to Boston. He couldn't make it. And he turned to one of his colleagues, a man, he couldn't make it either. Then next choice, Jane, why not? She said she would do it, but only on her own terms. And uh, so, so, so Douglas Haskell sent out a letter to the conference organizer, who happened to be one of the very few women in the Harvard um, Architecture School at that time. So he sent this letter. If another woman would not be out of place, might I suggest, 
Might I suggest that a substitute be Mrs. Mrs. Robert Jacobs. Uh, Jane Jacobs on our masthead. And I, I have to marvel at the way he, he put in the Mrs. Robert Jacobs. Uh, I, guess, I guess the idea of if, if she were a single woman uh, and we're going up there, that would be really um, out of the ordinary. I'm not sure how they could have handled that. But, but she went up there, she uh, came back and, and wa she wowed the audience at Harvard. Um, she came back, Holly White heard about her um, success up there. And he asked Jane to contribute an article um, that he was pulling together in 1958 or so, a series of uh, articles that Fortune was calling the Exploding Metropolis. And this, uh, this article turned into a book um, Notice the uh, subtitle, A Study of the Assault on Urbanism and How Our Cities Can Resist It. Uh, White and other people at Fortune were already noticing the, the fact that, that, that cities, some people city, thought cities were in decline. They certainly had been threatened by the uh, interstate highway system, which was launched in 1956. Um, suburbs were beginning to sprout out, sprout up. And, uh, and Jane's article, Downtown is for People, um, gained a lot of attention, even from the, uh, the Rockefeller brothers, um, who were interested in financing research in this new field. Um, and, and Jane said she could do it, uh, but she needed some funding. And so White knew the Rockefellers slightly because of an article that he had done for Fortune on big foundations. Um, in that article, incidentally, he criticized Rockefeller and Ford in particular for being uh, too cautious in their choice of grant recipients, uh, but he knew them nevertheless. He reached out and wrote a letter to one of the Rockefeller um, brothers' people saying, um, I believe the result, the result of Jane's work, may prove to be one of the great contributions to the whole field of urban planning and design. Jane, as a result, got a grant of $10,000, which um, would be about $85,000 today, quite a sizable some for a writer about to work on her first book. Uh, then she got into it, got deeper and deeper into it, and she needed more money, and uh, uh, White spoke up again. She got another $8,000. Um, and White's letter this time is, is uh, characteristic of his, of his uh, ability to take anything that appeared to be a problem and turn it into an opportunity and said, instead, as he wrote the letter vouching for the fact that she needed more money, he said, Quite frankly, I was happy to hear that she wants to spend more time on the book. I wholeheartedly recommend the additional assistance for the extra time. Uh, I believe a great and influential book is in the making. So White also had an, an article, several articles in that book, uh, The Exploding Metropolis. And he had one in particular um, that, that went by the standards of the 1950s, went viral. Um, it was on urban sprawl. and um, there he shows a uh, eucolic farm. If you look beyond the farm or across that pasture land there, you see a row of houses coming at you and they're coming and coming and coming. And, and, and people were, were struck by this and uh, were very concerned. Really, if, if people weren't defenders of the city, they were sure defenders of, of green open space. They loved it, hated to see it go. Um, so that story then led to a story in Life magazine um, and here's on the left, there's bulldozers scraping the land. On the right, there's a bunch of open space with the uh, schematics of how the big roads and suburban sprawling developments will go. Um, and, and, and how he's got a plan to save the vanishing U.S. countryside. Um, and the plan is to make the cities better and also apply some urban principles, to these scenic landscapes, um, acquire strategic easements to thwart development, use cluster housing, to minimize the impact of the land. Uh, and, and Holly, throughout the 60s, worked on this subject and came out with his 1968 book, The Last Landscape. Now, this book was conceived as, a, uh, as an ode to the great open spaces, but it ended with a detailed examination of the urban uh, landscape. At the, at the end, he has a chapter called uh, The Case for Crowding. And, uh, Everybody was worried about concentration and congestion. Um, people wanted to minimize the concentration, but Holly insisted, concentration is the genius of the city. It's reason for being. 
And, and the ultimate justification for building to higher densities is not only that it is more efficient in land costs, and he showed that it really was, uh, but that it can simply make a better city. So that attracted the attention of the New York City Planning Commission, um, which at that point um, had a bit of a problem. The city charter of 1938 it mandated that the city come up with a new master plan. But it never did. It deferred and deferred and deferred. And of course, one reason was that it had its own master planner, its power broker, Robert Moses. Why would you need to hire an expensive uh, set of consultants to come in and do a master plan? We got Robert Moses uh, planning whatever he wanted to do um, on his own personal drafting board. Uh, so they finally, they finally came out with one. They finally brought it in. Holly White was brought in to write this first. Um, this first, the first overall um, volume of it, which is called Critical Issues. This is a 17 inch by 17 inch um, format book, um, about 160 pages. It's one of six books in the whole series. The whole thing came out. Um, it, I think it weighed something like 25, 25 pounds, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars just to print it. Um, and, and what you discover is when you open it up, Begin starts right off. This plan is not a conventional master plan. It's not a physical plan. Our primary concern is with the processes for the city's growth. Um, and indeed, the, the plan was not conventional. However, as Ada Louise Huxtable says, we've got a revolution going on. And you shouldn't write off the revolution because it is being made by men in business suits. And she's referring to the people in the uh, in the New York City Planning Department, and probably to Holly White as well. And uh, I'm going to try to find my uh, ah, there we are. Um, and if the plan, if the plan that we have here was was not uh, was somewhat revolutionary, was not con uh, conventional. The video that went with it um, was even more was even more unconventional. I'm gonna I'm gonna show a clip, um, and 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 the video is undoubtedly reflecting some of the dynamics of the uh, of the progressive planners that were in the New York City Planning Department at that time. They were impatient with the pace of change, um, and so it, it, I'm sure they wanted it to be authentic, and they certainly achieved that. Um, there's no glossing over the city's problems. Uh, this first clip is a, is a condensation of the actual opening montage that was shown uh, on New York Public Television just a few days after the master plan was officially released. Now, I have cut about a minute out of it. The whole clip here is, is about a minute and 10 seconds. Um, but even despite those cuts, um, forewarning here, I did, I did leave in one uh, disturbing image. So I'm going to Shift to video now. Two million people pour into Manhattan below 60th Street. That's like transporting the combined populations of Baltimore, Boston, and Cincinnati. They come by bus, car, foot, bike, air, subway, and motor scooter. They work in advertising agencies, corporate offices, clothing factories, and department stores. They come because this is where it's all going on. This is the National Center. Yeah, so every day, 
every day, two million people come into this uh, city, but it's this partially dysfunctional, potentially lethal environment. Um, and if you were the uh, uh, New York City Planning Department, if you were advising the New York City Planning Department on their public relations, you'd say, well, gosh, guys, maybe now you've got to show the uh, uh, the New York City Planning Department saving the day, because this, this is a day that needs to be saved. So the, uh, the people who are shown next in the film are on the left, that's Don Elliott, chairman of the New York City Planning Commission, high-powered lawyer. On the right is Jack Robertson. Uh, Jack is a, is a Rose Scholar from Yale. Um, he's a Christian kind of guy, he's a descendant of, of two former presidents, James Madison and Zachary Taylor. Uh, he's also one of the founders of the Planning Commission's Urban Design Group. Uh, this was a much vaunted group of planners that Mayor John V. Lindsay um, uh, brought in in 1967. Uh, and the idea was not just to tell developers what they couldn't do, uh, but also what they could do. They're gonna be innovative, pluralistic, work with officials, developers, and so on. Um, so they're meeting with a group of residents from Hell's Kitchen on the west side of Manhattan, a working class neighborhood, as you'll see, uh, where the city wants to place a, uh, a new housing development. And um, as we watch the video, I, I urge you to watch, watch the body, watch the body language. Total project of 3,000 and some units, uh, of which 1,000 would be low income, 1600 would be moderate income, say $35 per room, and the remaining 400 would be middle income. I feel that we're being neglected in terms of we're being uh, more and more commercialized and not having the residential part of the community preserved in any way. Commercialism will come in and wipe us out. The question on all of our minds is when is something going to happen? Uh, we don't move as fast as private people. I wish we did. Uh, we've got to go through this elaborate procedure and, and you know, in the long run, I think it's going to work. When you took the 50th Street site for a school, was it five years ago? Yeah. And you discoated all those tenants and we've even had to come and beg to you, make it at least a playground for a while until you do something with it. I'm living there for 16 years now. What will I do? I, I can't get in the project, can't see so good with my eyes. And I have to get out because I have to use four keys to go in. One key outside, one key in the vestibule, one key for downstairs where I am, and one key to my own door. I can't do that. I can't even go, uh, I can't even go home when it's dark. That's why I don't even go out. I want to go out and I want to get out of there the worst way and I can't seem to get anything. I don't know what to do. What is the matter? I mean, no, the city really has to start to think in terms of people. They, they really do. You know, that number of people without a place to live, a decent place to live. Well, is it any wonder that our city is in the condition it's in? Right, and that is our thing. Effective planning means listening. Experts are full of ideas. Residents sometimes come up with better ones. This is the house that's next. Yeah, residents are full of ideas. Um, sometimes better than what the experts have, as a matter of fact. So as it turned out, at, at, as a result of working on this uh, master plan, uh, White himself was, became one of those residents who had a better idea. And, and his was particularly about privately owned public open spaces in Manhattan. In the course of uh, doing the research on the master plan in 1969, discovered that developers were getting huge bonuses in floor area ratios. Uh, they could add multiple extra stories beyond what zoning would normally allow, um, all in return for carving out some kind of a public plaza at the base of the building. Um, those public plazas often turned out to be less than desirable, big blank walls, um, kind of barren spaces. Uh, White, as he investigated, quickly found out that it was sort of a bad deal for the city, very bad deal, and also a bad deal for the public. So he formed a small study group called the Street Life Project, um, which later became the Project for Public Spaces, which is still active today. 
Um, White and his young interns found many spaces that were inhospitable. You didn't have to go far to find them. Sometimes they were even inaccessible, literally walled off from the, from the public. So White lobbied Don Elliott um, for, for Elliott to make changes in the zoning law. Um, and Elliott, after um, some persuasion, finally decided to go along, but he said only if White could determine, it's a quote, hard guidelines uh, that could be made part of the zoning law. So, um, so White essentially at that point uh, began practicing urban planning um, without a license. Now, I don't think he had any of those uh, uh, ACIP credits, but he, but he sure did have that Marine Corps experience. Um, and he made this statement shortly after he uh, uh, got working on the public spaces in New York. Um, the, the Guadalcanal experience um, came in very handy. So how did he approach it? He, 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 he and his interns are running around the streets of New York City. Um, for one thing, he avoided relying on telescopic views. White had been um, leery of telescopic views for a long time. He felt they um, obscured and, and distorted the view of what was really happening on the ground. Um, and so he was, there he is, on the ground. Um, you may see a wave of humanity walking through you in the telescopic uh, view. White is seeing people one by one as they pass by him. Um, the New York Daily News took notice of him at one point. Um, this man's been spying on us. Uh, it wasn't exactly spying, but White did have a way of being a little surreptitious with his camera. There he is. Um, didn't want to uh, affect the behavior of people by, by pushing a camera uh, in their face. Um, and as he, um, uh, as he had written way back in 1958, he said, looking at models and bird's eye renderings gives no clues. He wrote, you have to get out and walk. And so that was White out there and walking. And additionally, you had to remember, don't judge people by their intentions, but judge them by their actions. And uh, you could... Uh, Find an example of that right at Paley Park. Here's Paley Park, lovely little vest pocket park on I think uh, East 53rd Street in Manhattan. Um, looks wonderful. People told White, "Oh, we go there because it's um, because it's peaceful and quiet. We love it there." You went by their words, you'd say, "Well, let's just design peaceful and quiet parks all over Manhattan. We'll, we'll be home free." But White looked at the context of that park. There it is, right just feet away from the busy sidewalk and a, and a blaring honking um, street. He knew that the, that the water wall there provided, created some noise. He went in with a decibel meter and, and discovered that the sound inside Paley Park um, was as noisy and loud as, as the sound on any New York street or even a subway station. Um, but still they went there. So the question was, why, why did they do it? So White pulled all this research together in 1980 in this, this book, which is referred to even today by some landscape architects and urban planners as, as the little red book. It's, it is slightly uh, subversive in its own way. And I have four quick clips to show you from, from this um, um, video. And, and, I'll, and I'll show you the opening of the film. Um, and I, and I hope you'll note the diversity of the scenes that, that White presents. Um, you, you don't need the Seagram's Fortune uh, or Mies van der Rohe to have a successful public place. <laughs> This is the plaza of the Seagram building in New York. Late morning. With a time-lapse camera, we were testing a hypothesis. The sun, we were pretty sure, would be the chief factor in determining where people would sit or not sit. Now, just after 12, they begin to sit. Right where the sun is. I was enormously pleased. What a perfectly splendid correlation. It was quite misleading, as we were to see later, but it was a very encouraging way to start. 
We were studying the Seagram Plaza because it was one of the most popular. Many people didn't think that it would be, but it was, and we wanted to find out why. Our research group, the Street Life Project, had been observing other kinds of city spaces. One was a block of 101st Street in East Harlem. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, but almost every factor that later we were to find was important for a city space, we could have found out right here. The clues were right under our noses. So in the next two slides, the next two video clips, I should say, um, White really presents the secret sauce. What is what is the underlying premise uh, that makes a good public space? Um, what makes some work, some not? Um, but first, he shows his work. So you'll see a few charts and graphs, uh, probably about ten or fifteen seconds worth. But then he gets then he gets to the meat of the of the project here. We come to the question, why do some plazas work and others not? We rank 15 plazas by the average number of people sitting, They're running somewhere from around 170 down to about oh, a handful, 20 or 30. Now, most of these plazas are comparable in size. Why then the difference? Was it the amount of open space? No, if anything, there's a reverse correlation. What about sitable space? And here we get a bit closer. And had we ranked these uh, in terms of qualitative sitting, we would have a much clearer relationship. We checked many other things, elevation, male-female ratio, species, and so on and so on, charts in stupefying succession. But as we put them all together, one major finding began to shine through. And I now share it with you. This might not strike you as an intellectual bombshell, but this simple lesson is one that very few cities have ever heeded. They're tough places to sit in. We come to that wonderful invention, the movable chair. It's one of the reasons you have such a feeling of choice at places like Paley or Greenacre. You are doing the deciding. It's very interesting to watch how people manipulate chairs. Here you can sort of tell there's going to be a rather aggressive movement. Now, whatever the purpose of all this rearranging, it does make for a rather pleasant social ritual, and you'll see many variants of this, often quite lengthy. Even when there's no apparent functional reason of any kind, people move chairs. Watch this girl. Now, she's no more in the sun than she was before. Fixed. Individual seats don't work very well. For lovers, uh, love seats are all right. The distances are quite comfortable, but not for most people. Furthermore, chairs like this are telling you, you sit here and you sit there. So uh, White's film on the plaza is about to end. I'll show the last clip. Um, and once again, um, uh, note the socioeconomic range and the diversity of this, uh, this presentation, please. It was only after we had studied many other places that I realized we could have learned all of the lessons right here on 101st Street. It's an excellently scaled block, a comfortably sized space, very nicely enclosed, lots of people, and food, food. Very social activity, too. Water? Yes. Yeah. And you can touch it, you can aim it, you can slosh around in it. Sitting, the best kind of space, slightly elevated. The lot at the corner is used for games, but the street itself is the number one area for recreation, including that very popular form, the polishing of the car. This block has its problems, but it works as a place. Here we are, back at Seagram. A group of music students are giving a little impromptu concert. Some executives are still conferring. It's a very nice time. Just before 2 o'clock, everybody's about ready to close up.
so we end our film on plazas, not on a plaza, but on the street itself. And that's where we should. The street is the river of life for the city. We come to these places not to escape from it, but to partake of it. The elements of a successful public space. You could find it at the uh, up on uh, East 101st Street in East Harlem there, or at Seagram's Plaza. Uh, sitting city space, sun, trees, water, some combination thereof. Food triangulation. That's where two people get together and look. Two people who don't know each other get together and observe some third thing or some third person, and begin conversing as if they were uh, long lost friends. And then of course um, the all important street so how hard can it be uh, uh, there's the elements we've talked about triangulation um, and um, I went to New York a while back uh, and went into a, one of the new public spaces I entered into the old Penn Station terrible dreary and so on walked over to the new Moynihan train hall and it is just just gorgeous on the outside it's so gorgeous that they actually have a photo rendering mural of the station inside. It's a piece of art inside of the building's exterior. Um, now, why this gentleman had to sit right in front of my uh, my view of that mural, I don't quite know, but then we begin to see a pattern. Um, there's more people standing around. There's somebody sitting. Well, she's found a place to sit. Uh, here's a person having a, looks like a brown bag lunch. Um, and she's found a place to sit. And of course, um, the problem with the Moynihan thing is that they still haven't figured out the sitting. Sitting is an important part of a public space. They're a little afraid to do it here at Moynihan. This gentleman is on his briefcase. And what's interesting is that every one of them has um, found as the solution to their problem, a movable chair, essentially their own, take it with you, uh, movable chair. They can set their location. Um, anytime they want. Um, but we shouldn't be surprised because as White wrote, it's difficult to design a space that will not attract people. Uh, what is remarkable is how often it's happened. So in, in the White book, I, I promise that if you spend a few hours with Holly White, you won't look at public spaces around you in the same way as you did before. Um, you won't look at the organizations that you're part of in the same way as you did before. Um, but I wondered, what about the planning process itself? Is, is there any way we could look at the planning process um, and look at it through the William H. White lens? Um, so I gave it a try. And, and um, now, of course, Holly could be a little bit um, uh, glib in his uh, assessment of planners. Um, there's, there's that famous quote, planners would prefer to go to uh, hell with a plan than heaven without one. He also wrote back in 1958, he wrote little plans, lots of them are just what, what are needed. Uh, forget the big plan, he essentially was saying, let the free market tell its story. Um, so while it's easy to be glib, I'm, uh, I'm gonna try to direct my remarks here, not just to planning officials, but also elected officials, appointed officials, um, the lay people in a city who are concerned, um, and even the media, those of us who uh, try to cover this, uh, uh, this, this complicated uh, field of urban planning. Um, so I think, Holly, um, a couple of points about planning. One is that you've got to know your, just like as, as a bottle canal, you had to know what your territory was. What were you defending? Um, and and um, Holly would be, uh, just amazed at all the great use of public spaces that came up during COVID. Now here's a uh, public space in, in my hometown. It's probably the number one public space in the town. Um, a demonstration's going on right here. This was pre-COVID. If you did the same thing today, that whole demonstration would be have to would have to be moved to the, to the right, um, uh, probably about 30 or 40 feet, because the town, I think wisely, gave Part of the public space over to the restaurants that bordered the, uh, the public space and uh, let them have outdoor dining during COVID. It was a 
it was a smart thing to do. It was uh, it was good, and it and it's still going on. And so, um, someone asked um, at a council meeting, "Well, what's the arrangement here? When do when do we get our space back? Um, how long does the restaurant get to keep it?" Um, and the the interesting thing was that no one really knew for sure. Um, so we're not guarding our public space quite as much as we can. Um, here's a nice little public space uh, behind a uh, an apartment building, um, and I think it's a public space. Although when you walk by it, you you don't realize it is. There's nothing welcoming you inside. Um, we remember the video of of what makes a good public space. This one violates a couple of rules. It's a few steps down. It's got no movable chairs. Um, um, but I had suspected that it was a public space. And the giveaway for me um, was this sign. It um, doesn't tell you what you can do. It tells you what you can't do. Um, and that, unfortunately, is all too often the, uh, the way in, in which public places um, uh, are presented to the public. Um, I, I love the one three, three lines down, no horseplay. So, you're thinking about horseplay, don't come to this place to do it. Um, so I have to confess, Cincinnati, as a member of the media, that I haven't yet reported on, on, this, uh, on this inventory of public space. But it's a story that really needs to be told. Another thing that White um, reported on and, and talked about during the war, during World War II, um, he talked about the need to pre present information to uh, uh, to the fellow soldiers in his in, in, in his case, but to the public in our case here now, um, with, with information that would make sense, information that you could easily um, accomplish. Um, all too often, he says, it's just the devil with it. Here's a bunch of figures. You figure it out. Um, we have a uh, uh, little skirmish going on in our town right now. Here's a uh, an affordable housing site blank parking, some old buildings and an empty parking lot. That's 900 feet of frontage on uh, uh, this uh, Franklin Avenue here. Um, and the town is mandated by the court to put in 80 affordable housing units. But some of us, in fact, a lot of people showed up at a meeting and said, why, why is it just 80? Let's make it inclusionary. Instead of creating an 80 unit affordable housing complex, a project, let's make it an inclusive thing 160 units, and you don't know who's in the affordable ones and who isn't. Make it much more of a community a community effort. Of course, 160, the neighbors begin to say, oh my gosh, that's 50 units per acre. And the planners and zoners and so on say, yeah, that's that's 50 units per acre. That's, that's a lot of density. And of course, as we know, people are afraid of density. So uh, I began looking around and saying, well, how, how bad is 50 units per acre? And I tried to find some uh, around town, and I found one here. This is the yellow house over here, seven units on a uh, about an um, eighth of an acre lot. Um, that works out to just a little over 50 units an acre. People drive, walk right by it all the time. Nobody's bothered by it. Um, you might wonder, what's it like to, neighbors do wonder, what's it like to live next door to 50 units per acre? I'd hate to do it. And uh, well, I, I can tell you what it's like because the house on the left is my house. Um, that's where I'm, I'm coming to you from right now. And I've been living next to 50 units an acre for the last 30 years or so, and I'm, um, I'm no worse for wear. So uh, um, I, didn't, I didn't realize it, however, until recently. A couple of blocks away, there's something more in the scale of what we're talking about. This is, this is 37 units on, on less than an acre. Uh, when you prorate this out, this comes out to about 55 units per acre. Um, and people um, people walk by this one all the time and, and love it. So um, 50 units an acre, we don't have to be afraid of. So as Holly pointed out, observation's a, a, a tough business. Um, lots of hours, takes a lot of patience. Frankly, you can get tired. Um, doing that all, all that observation, um, and uh, so the the, the um, interesting thing here is that the towns so often do this work, but they don't show people what they've done, 
and we've got a street, another street in Princeton here. Um, it's got to be reconstructed. The infrastructure is failing, sewer connections and so on. The sidewalk is in disrepair. There's a steep drop off between the sidewalk and the street. Um, it's got to be reconstructed. And so naturally, um, uh, the, the bicycle people come out and say, you know, we've got to throw a bike lane in here as well. Now, um, if you look at it, um, you'd say it's going to be tough to put a bicycle lane in here. Um, there's quite a bit of, uh, quite a few limitations. Um, in, in the journalism world, we might say you're, uh, you're trying to pack 10 pounds of streetscape into a five pound right of way um, or something like that. Um, and, but to their credit, I think our town officials in this case did not just summarily dismiss the idea. Uh, instead, and in fact, this is still an ongoing discussion, they came out and showed um, what it would look like with a reconstruction, but without a bike lane. And then they showed how they might be able to squeeze a single one-way bike lane um, uh, coming up the hill. Um, and this is in concept B. And when you see, compare A to B, you see that the street, street trees and the phone poles and so on have to be moved out uh, into several, take up several spaces for parking. You also discover that um, um, that a whole bunch of street trees are going to be lost in the uh, uh, in, in the transition there. And uh, you know what? As I say, they haven't they they have not come to their final conclusion yet, but they have um, shown people item by item what the pros and the cons are of each of those two concepts. So if, if the bike lane is rejected, people will know that there, were some, there was some thought that went into it. It was not just a, a, a summary decision. And the final thing that, that is part of the planning process, and that is the, uh, the listening. Everybody uh, now, you know, I, I guess these um, public outreach efforts are baked into the, uh, the process. Um, we all do it. So uh, group harmony is, of course, uh, the goal sometimes, uh, but that is not always a, a blessing. Sometimes you've got to have some frustrations and tensions. Um, in Princeton, uh, recently, we, uh, the town took a look at re reconstructing the, the, the main dining block in town right off of Nassau Street, creating a one-way pedestrian-oriented um, street, getting rid of a lot of the parking, almost all of it, creating outdoor spaces for dining and socializing and so on. And the town wrangled with all sorts of different uh, approaches to this. And uh, um, a, a lot of dissension, the, the, art, the planning department, and engineering department had to go back and make changes and more changes. So somebody from the business world pulled in Jeff Speck and asked him to come in and take a look. And, and, and Jeff came in, he pulled no punches, uh, he criticized a lot of the approaches that were being considered. He took the town to task, even for some things that they had done right. Um, some of the designs were just too suburban. Um, the, the towns had replaced some diamond-shaped sections of sidewalk with clunky rectangular blocks. Um, you're ignoring your brand, he said. And uh, it was um, it was enough. It's going to clearly it's going to send the uh, make the planning department, the engineering department, go back to their uh, back to the drawing board yet again and here the loops bids have to be put out very soon the, the, the contracts have to be let and so on um, but after the second presentation he made um, the town officials didn't just walk away from jeff they sat there and talked with him privately the crowd is left uh, the meeting room is empty and there's jeff speck third from the left in the dark uh, sport coat the mayor and the blue shirt taking notes person to the left of the mayor is one of the council members. Uh, and the woman uh, in the glasses staring intently at Jeff Speck as he stares back at her is the engineer. And she's been the person who's been through the ringer, has had to uh, become practically a landscape architect as well as an engineer, listening to all these different competing voices. But she's here listening to Jeff right at the end. Notice the body language, nobody's pulling away. Um, unlike the meeting with the Hell's Kitchen neighbors, everybody's intent, lots of notes are being taken. And I think the final plan, which we hope to see in about a year, will be much better um, because of it. 
So what's for the future? Um, how much of White's stuff, White's work, White's teachings are going to carry forward? He, he was a little, he's the guy who always saw the glass half full, never half empty, but he was just a touch pessimistic toward the end of his life. Boy, here are all these planners for whom the formative experience is a, uh, is a suburban shopping mall. And uh, well, I'm happy to say that I've run into a bunch of people um, who not only think that Holly is their hero, but who many people who have seen that film, The Urban Life of Small Urban Spaces, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces, and who have read the book. Um, and and there's, a, there's a lot of them out there and they're doing some very interesting things. Um, a couple of years ago, I watched a film with a group of people from a green benefit district in San Francisco. And um, just a couple of months ago, about a year after we had um, seen the movie, I got an update from one of the ex organizers of that event. Um, and she said, we watched the film with a, with a group of people in San Francisco. Um, and several of us got inspired by the idea of movable seating in plazas. Uh, so we applied it to one of our green spaces. It's this one right here. It hadn't been very inviting to the public before. They brought in a bunch of sturdy red chairs, put them out, um, she reports, and the results have been fantastic. And there you are. Um, um, she continues. Then she, they've added several red tables to the mix. Um, and, and, and this, um, this person from San Francisco, a woman named Kat Sawyer, continues, this all began with inspiration from William H. White. I thought you would appreciate knowing that the ripples continue. And they do. So meanwhile, on the West Coast, that's on the East Coast, on the East Coast, I, I, uh, while I was working on the American Urbanist, um, I heard about a team of architects at SWA Associates um, and one of their principals, Anya Domleski. Um, and and this, these people were working on some algorithmic software, which could provide, uh, they, they termed it a real-time object detection system, um, which they hoped would revisit the findings of White's social life of small urban spaces. And uh, they could put a camera out and get video and the, the artificial intelligence, time-lapse photography and so on, um, could, could identify people and their movements through a plaza. Um, that time-consuming process that White went through, um, they could handle in, uh, in a matter of minutes. So, um, so I wondered, where did she hear about White? How did she know about it? And, and Anya mentioned she had been a student at Mount Holyoke. She saw the film, once again, saw the film, said, I've got a major in landscape architecture, transferred over to Smith, um, which offered a degree in the field. Then she went on for a master's at Harvard in the Graduate School of Design. Um, and, and continues to this kind of work today. So what, what would White think about that? Um, well, turns out he did think about things like that, the, the evolving nature of technology. Um, and back at the end of World War II, when he's writing this, television is coming in. Um, they're, they're talking about uh, teletype machines that can gather data and bring it together, um, a, a, a national registry of fingerprints. Um, but White says, whatever the technology is, the principle is going to rem remain the same. Get the data recorded and then classify it. And um, I, find it, uh, I find it remarkable that uh, here we are 80 years later, uh, and I'm still reciting another lesson from, from White's uh, postgraduate education, the Guadalcanal. So I want to end my presentation about Hollywood um, with a story about not exactly Holly, but about myself. But it shows the triangulation at work. It shows the small, the uh, social life film at work. So you may have heard that authors don't get uh, book tours anymore, um, hardly ever, mostly Zoom. But I decided I don't get a tour, but maybe the book deserves to get a tour. So I took the book with me to Barbados. Um, this is one of the great um, pedestrian experiences in the world, this mile long boardwalk on the southern coast. We went there. Um, we went to the other extreme in Barbados. There's still challenges here. Um, um, some of White's principles could be put to work to, to create, to make better sidewalk infrastructure. This poor lady with a cane couldn't proceed until I uh, uh, got the book out of the way. Um, so we took the book to a posh place on the West Coast. 
And I put the book out and took my picture for the book tour and um, an example of triangulation. You see the woman on the left um, across the table from her is her, is her uh, gentleman friend. Um, he sees me taking the picture, comes over and say, what's going on with the, uh, the picture? Is that, is, that your, is that your book? And I explained the idea of the book tour, just a joke, having fun. And he said, no, but I really want to buy your book. You do? And he said, yes. I studied urban design at Ryerson University in Toronto, and I saw the social life of small urban spaces. I've got to buy your book. And as much as I would have liked to sell it to him, I didn't because that would have ruined the book tour. It was the only copy I had. Um, so I lost a sale right there. And uh, so that brings me to our final slide. Um, and here's the offer from Island Press. So. If anybody, if even one person buys a book, um, we've offset the loss that I incurred um, on the island of Barbados. Um, but another good reason uh, to pay attention to this is I see they offer a 30% discount. And another good reason is that uh, you're supporting Island Press, which um, I have to say has just been a terrific, uh, terrific group to partner with. So on that note, thank you, Michael and John and Maryland Department of Planning. Thank you, Island Press. Thank you, audience. And if there's any Marines out there, Semper Fi. Thanks for your intelligent military service. Okay, thank you, Richard. We have uh, one last poll question before we go into the Q&A. And that is, uh, what is the chance that a planning agency today would underwrite a film such as the one White narrated in 1969? And you have four options there. Um, and those of you who are still with us, please exit from full screen mode. If you want to um, respond to this, we'll give you all a few seconds to do so before we go into the question and answer. And thanks to everybody who um, has submitted a question already and comments. We've actually gotten a number of comments about White and his work and applications that Richard was speaking about. So we'll give you a, maybe 15 more seconds to respond. and interesting range here. A couple more seconds. And thanks again to John Coleman. So 53% says there's a slight chance, 27% good chance, 18% uh, no chance, and only 2% think it's very likely that a planning agency would do such a project. Um, okay, we'll ask Richard to turn his camera on as well so you can see him during the Q&A, and we'll go for maybe another 20, 25 minutes with the uh, ones that we've received. And again, uh, you can continue to submit questions um, through the questions tab. And we still want to see you, John, or uh, Richard. John, do you want to give him the prompt? Okay, um, we got, actually, Richard, we got a lot of comments and questions regarding the chairs that we that you were showing at the end and um, mm -hmm. a lot of them going toward uh, wondering well I'll just read one of them I guess uh, this is very interesting but how do we how do urban areas solve the issue of movable chairs and tables being stolen moved out from their locations I think that's the, the common concern with having those available yeah well, um, as White said, make make uh, little plans, lots of them, um, and you might want to try putting out a few chairs at once and see what happens. The experience has been that very few chairs are stolen. Um, White took in, took great interest in this in New York uh, in the 1980s, and he kept track of the uh, the reports from Paley Plaza um, and discovered that almost no chairs were stolen. Um, Heinz Plaza here in Princeton has um, 40 or so uh, movable chairs. They're, they're quite nice looking. Um, I wouldn't mind having one um, out in my backyard, but, um, but nobody's, nobody's stolen them. And uh, it, it, it's turned out not to be a problem. Uh, some places have, have found, in fact, the people in San Francisco who were um, maybe a little nervous about that, um, found out that a that a restaurant owner who was on the edge of this uh, this uh, park, the Green Benefit District, had uh, uh, 
had, had opened up to chairs. Uh, the, the restaurant owner brought the chairs in at night. Now, I, I'm not sure that's necessary. Um, I think a lot of people today understand that there's surveillance cameras just about wherever we go. Um, and the idea of grabbing a chair um, might be much less tempting than it was back in the 1980s. But even in the 1980s, um, the chairs by and large were not stolen. But I think the, the uh, solution is to move slowly, put a few out. Um, some, some people have discovered that the chairs are so inexpensive that it is, it is less um, costly to just allow a few to be stolen and then replace them than to go through the security measures that you'd have to go through to, uh, to keep each and every one safe. So um, it's a good question, but I think some, uh, and certainly in White's case, uh, experience told him that it wasn't a problem. Yes, and in response to that, a number of people are commenting that in Bryant Park in New York City, that very few chairs are actually stolen, taken away from there as well. Yeah, and 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 the chairs in Bryant Park are, uh, um, they definitely are there. That was the first the first thing Holly said had to be done in Bryant Park when he when he put forth the grand the grand plan to to bring Bryant Park back into the public realm, or the usable public realm. He said, the first thing you've got to do is put out movable chairs. As it turned out, it was about the last thing that happened, but it was it was critical to the whole the whole situation. And it's good to hear that they're that they're still there. Excellent. Okay, well, we'll get into the questions here. And again, folks can continue to submit them as we go through this. Um, first one is from Sarah DeLeon, who's asking a kind of a big question, she admits, and that is, what is it that makes a city beautiful? I realize that this is a big question, my, but my experience is that the beauty and pleasure of living in a city is not just a checklist, it's much more than the sum of its parts. For example, adding X number of acres of parks per square mile here or Y number of fountains there. Maybe my question is really asking, what gives a city a heart or a soul or the feeling that people have bonded with their city rather than it just being a place where they happen to live? As examples, if asked about New York City or Chicago or New Orleans, would people say that those cities were beautiful or had a heart, more of a heart than, let's say, Dallas or Houston, with no offense intended toward those other cities? But what makes the urban experience that people feel in living in or visiting a city so starkly different from one city to the next? Well, the, great question. The, interesting, the title of the film for the New York City Master Plan 1960 is What is the City But the People? And um, I, I think that doesn't really answer the question, but it, it sort of um, addresses it at least. Um, you know, the experience, the experience of meeting with other people, um, the, 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 um, the COVID, the, the early days of COVID gave us an example of what it was like when everybody was hunkered down and and uh, and not out and about, and how much uh, when we did get out and about, how much um, value there was to to just seeing other people on the sidewalk um, and saying hi to total strangers um, as they walked by, discovering that the sidewalks weren't wide enough, deciding, you know, discovering that public places um, could accommodate us and and we could have social interaction. Um, I think that's a that's a big part of it, and I also think that that little checklist of of things that you take away from the um, from the film, the, the social life of small urban spaces, um, on that checklist, there's not there's there's not some there's not a line for careful carefully designed parks and parks and plazas, you know, as this as this um, questioner um, suggests, you know, it's it's not a matter of of, of just having a cohesive uh, plan, although that can certainly help facilitate things, but um, things that bring people together in, in big ways and little ways, I would say, are, are at the heart of it. But if I knew the answer any more, then I would, I would really have to um, pretend to be an urbanist and an urban planner. I'm just a journalist. Thanks, Richard. Um, here's another big question, which is probably another good place to start in the Q&A, and that is, um, how did you decide to write a book about Mr. White? Yeah, it, um, we've heard about people saying that uh, uh, White is their hero. Um, I was walking, um, I had read The Last Landscape in, in the early 1970s. 
Um, and I remembered the line from it that, that urban landscapes could be made better when, when previously unused spaces were put to good use. Um, and all these many years later, in, in 2017, um, I'm walking down, and this is, could only happen because I, it's a walkable city, and I walk. I'm walking down the main street in town, and I see this little 10-foot wide, 80-foot long alley um, being repurposed into a uh, sort of an arts and performance exhibition space. And I went up to one of the guys working on it, and I said, you know, what you're doing is right out of the William H. White playbook. And uh, this guy turns and looks to me and says, oh, Holly White. Holly White's my hero. And at that point, I didn't know who he was talking about uh, because I didn't know that, that White's nickname was Holly. I just, I just always knew him as the man named William H. White who had written The Last Landscape. So, but that was the trigger for the whole thing. I said, wow. Uh, and so I went back, Googled him, and I thought, you know, I'll, I'll see what biographies plural have already been written about this guy. Um, and I discovered that, that he had sort of been lost um, uh, to the biographers at least. And uh, I said, well, now's the time to, to revisit William H. White. Thank you, Richard. Um, it's a question here from David Birkenthal who asks, uh, did Jane Jacobs and White butt heads much when they were both working in New York City? It seems like uh, two of the great personalities of urban history might have had their clashes. Well, interestingly, I don't think they ever did have any clashes. Jane, of course, um, moved out of New York um, in the late 1960s. She was concerned about uh, the Vietnam War, the draft. She had draft eligible sons, and she moved, the, the, she and the whole family just up and, and moved to Toronto um, at about that time. But um, but much later in her life, um, uh, she was asked um, uh, uh, by um, uh, Jim Kunstler, uh, the, the urbanist and journalist, did a, did a fascinating interview with her. And um, he, uh, he asked her who her friends were when she was in New York. And she says, oh, Holly White um, um, was one, one of the few that I had. And she said, Holly and I were always very much on the same wavelength. And, um, and I think that was absolutely true. And, and the, Holly, at one point in the, in the early 90s, wrote an introduction to a re, a re edition, a reissue of the uh, Exploding Metropolis. And he kind of uh, followed up on the popular notion that people have that Jane was sort of an undiscovered um, person who suddenly was discovered and, and out of the, off a blank slate, wrote the, the, the social life, the, or the, um, um, the, the uh, city book, and um, and that of course um, was not at all was not at all true. But but how I sort of um, have casually mentioned that, so people thought he was putting her down. But um, in fact, Jane at the end of her life came in her last book, um, uh, Dark Age Ahead. Um, Jane. Jane really um, echoed a lot of things that Holly White had written about in the 1950s. Thanks, Richard. As I mentioned, we did receive a number of uh, comments here, so I'll give you one and you could perhaps respond to it. And this is from uh, Jane, Jane Ree, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your uh, name correctly. Um, and it's not a question, but just to thank you for the session and for the nostalgia. I met William White once as a student planner. He was a kind and brilliant man. For my final in my urban design class, I did the chair experiment in the campus plaza and filmed the full day. No chairs left the plaza, all were used, and every single person who sat moved the chair first. I showed, <laughs> um, fast forward to set the theme music to, for the sting and got an A for that one. Anyway, that was a long time ago, and, but the lessons of uh, WHW still serve, especially the concept of triangulation. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm amazed. I, I'm, I was still gobsmacked by the guy in Barbados who comes up out of the blue and, and says he, he knows White and he's seen the film. And here we are, you know, 5,000 miles, however many miles away from, uh, from Toronto. And, uh, and, and he and I come together over White. Okay. 
Um, next question here is from uh, Patricia Hauser, who asks, uh, could you elaborate just a bit on your interesting and important comment about the use of inclusionary housing as an alternative to just an affordable unit? Yeah, I um, I think it's it's a, it's a shame what's happened in a lot of towns, and and, and here I am in the, the progressive town of Princeton, New Jersey, and and we've had a number of uh, affordable housing uh, projects that have gone in. We have a senior housing project that's that's gone in, um, and I would say most of these, no, half of them anyhow, have been put out in the in the in the wilderness practically. Um, a long a bus ride away from downtown on the edge of town, no neighbors, no neighbors to complain. I'm not sure why they would complain. So the idea of making these uh, units inclusionary, uh, bringing in market rate units to go with them, um, it, it, it raises the level of the project, number one, uh, gives the, the developers of the project more reason to maintain the project. Uh, and, and, and maintenance is always going to be a problem. That was Bad maintenance was half of the problem with the Pruitt Ego housing in St. Louis, um, not just the design of it. But um, but but to do that, you've really got to you've got to bring people together, and you, and you've got to create housing that uh, the market rate people won't won't walk away from, and and that's where location is just absolutely so key. Um, people would love to have to that that housing development that I showed you being considered on, on Franklin Avenue, 50 units per acre. Oh no, what are we gonna do about 50 units per acre? Well, that's all within a 10 minute walk of the Princeton University campus. Um, it's a fabulous location. Um, a lot of people would like to live there. Uh, so why don't we open it up to the, uh, to the whole spectrum? Great, thank you. Next question here is from Jocelyn Wank, who asks, uh, can you share your insights or White's insights about the importance of shade trees for streets and public spaces? Yeah, I, I, I am amazed at how much uh, attention White paid to, to shade trees when he, um, on the, when he had to read, when he volunteered to do a little urban, uh, urban planning there in the 1970s and, and shaped a lot of that zoning ordinance that came out in 1975, um, he had very specific stipulations about, about shade trees. He wanted them to, to, he had a formula for how many would have to be planted in each, um, in each public plaza in New York, um, how big they had to be when they went in. He didn't, he didn't want shade trees, he didn't want just little seedlings going. He wanted, he wanted trees to go in of a certain size and a certain uh, caliper. And, and that was written into the zoning code. And, and when it was all over, interestingly, uh, people said, oh boy, developers are gonna cry and scream, and you know, you, you're making them put in so many shade trees. Said the zoning ordinance went into effect and, and began to be applied. And he didn't hear one single complaint from a developer about the shade tree requirement, making him think naturally that maybe he should have made it a little more, a little more rigid, a little more rigorous. But, um, but he, he saw the, view, the beauty and, 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 and he saw the environmental um, effects of shade trees. Um, all of this at a time when, when the phrase um, climate change, um, as far as I know, back in the 1980s, uh, hardly existed. If anybody was using it, it certainly wasn't, um, it didn't come up in White's uh, writing. Thank you. Um, next question here is from Martin Burbaum, who says, uh, Princeton is hardly a typical urban environment. Many urban areas today on both coasts are trying to address issues of affordable housing and an extreme homelessness. What do you think White would say about these social equity issues? Today, such public spaces may be taken over by the homeless, especially if you provide them with movable chairs. Well, yeah, the, the homeless issue is not an issue that uh, that was nearly as severe when Rhett, when when White was writing his books. Um, there's no question about that. Um, he he referred to homeless people as he, he jokingly called them the undesirables, um, the odd people. Um, um, Holly was aware of the problem in in 1958 in the in the uh, exploding metropolis, um, a little book that really spells out every every urban issue that we still face to this day. 
all these many years later. Um, Howie said that at the rate we're going, cities are becoming uh, places of the very rich um, or the very poor um, or just the very odd. And uh, th those would be the few um, eccentrics that might be sleeping on a park bench here or there. But he saw the uh, affordable housing um, dynamics happening even there. Um, and, and I think he would say that uh, um, our friend in this fight is, is density. And while, and while Princeton, Princeton is not your typical uh, big city, um, it is a, a small city. Um, and, and the solution that we're finding here is to make things denser and uh, create more housing opportunities. The homeless uh, thing uh, um, I've, I've come to realize in, in working on this book, um, the homeless thing is really a, a, a sort is not always a housing problem. Sometimes, much more often, um, I'm told, and I'm not an expert on this, but I'm told it's a mental health problem. And uh, in fact, uh, Andy Manchell, who worked with uh, with White on Bryant Park, and Andy later wrote a book called Learning Learning from Bryant Park. He's got one of those movable chairs on the cover. Um, he talks about the, the problem of homelessness and, and says that, uh, it's, it's a difficult question and each homeless person uh, is his own particular set of problems that, that may not be related to whether or not they can afford to, to rent an apartment. So um, it, it's a complex issue, I agree. Great, thanks Richard. We'll ask a few more since uh, we've got so many here. Next question here is from Glenn Anderson who asks, with so many public spaces today being actually privately owned, at least where I live in Vancouver, how might White have suggested that cities work with private owners to enhance design and keep their spaces more fluid and adaptable? Well, I, I yeah, I think he would say that the, the private owner should, um, should think of the, the, the public realm and what it means to his to his community, and what and what that that value to his community in, ter in turn um, visits upon his private development. Um, you know, there's a I think the wonderful thing about uh, about looking at white is that you can uh, you can really look at it from from sort of the old fashioned um, Republican environmental um, capitalist point of view. Um, um, Environmentalism um, isn't socialism. It's it's really good business, and and if, and I think that White would appeal to a private developer on a on the basis of of profitability. If you want your your building um, sitting next to that um, private space, if you want that building to to have even greater value than it has today, make sure that that space down at the bottom uh, works from a whole public whole public point of view. Um, there's, um, you know, it's 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 a win-win situation, I think, for the public and for the private developer. I, I think he would have that would be White's approach. Um, and then at that point, whatever makes a public space good would make a privately owned public space good, uh, and that includes letting the public be part of it. Okay, thank you. Our next question here is from Jeff Price, who says, I'm, I'm intrigued about the concentration of activities and building transit-supported density. What do you think white solution for the American city now in 2022 would be for those of us who live outside of Manhattan? Yeah, I didn't quite hear the question there, Michael, for, de for transit-oriented? The questioner said he was uh, intrigued about concentrations of activities and building transit supportive density. And he's asking, what is White's solution for the American city in 2022 for those of us who live outside of Manhattan? I think the, um, you know, the, the, as, he, as he did in the last landscape, as, as, he, as it evolved in the last landscape, there are, there are lessons from the, from the urban core that can be, um, Put to play in the suburban setting, and um, there's there is absolutely no need. You're not going to ruin your suburb. You're not going to ruin um, uh, the open space that you have, but you can use it a heck of a lot better and make it go a lot further uh, if you employ some of those those urban strategies. Um, um, 
I mentioned Jeff Speck in the um, in, in the presentation. Um, he and Andres Duani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg uh, wrote the book Suburban Nation. Um, you'll see in the forward of that book they they credit uh, Jane Jacobs and Holly White as part of their inspiration and and they make the argument they take a lot of the, the things that white brought up in city rediscovering the center and they applied those principles to uh, to suburban settings um, and it was it was sort of it was a great way to build on what on what white had already done but um, I think the lessons do apply to the, to the suburban thing and the, and the biggest problem is fighting this this public perception that that density is bad um, you know the, the the image that dense density has to be congestion. Uh, congestion often is just a result of bad planning, bad bad architecture, ad hoc things that get built without anybody thinking about the consequences and so on. So um, I, I I would um, I would think there's a lot of opportunities for uh, for, for bringing the, uh, the urban lessons to the suburbs. We we go through it here in Princeton. People will get up at the town meeting and say, uh, we don't want Princeton to become a city. Whatever it happens, we don't want to be a city. We moved here because of this, the green grass, this and that. Well, we're here to try to preserve those things. And we're trying to use some urban uh, strategies to do so. OK, thank you. Just a couple more here and we'll, and we'll wrap. Um, next question here is, it sounds like you would say that William White subscribes to incrementalism recognizing that it takes a long time to implement plans and projects. How do you think he would ensure or advocate communities stick with achieving a long-term vision that is typically established in a comprehensive plan? That's a puzzler. Um, I guess communication, feedback, be, having planners and people who are involved in that comprehensive plan, um, being on the on the street and being out with the people, um, knowing their community, and uh, um, the the uh, you know the comprehensive plan doesn't need to doesn't have to preclude um, a lot of little pieces of action. Um, you know, a, a comprehensive plan could bring with it um, a call for um, Call for action um, every so often on whatever whatever uh, time frame you want. Every three months, we're gonna we're gonna roll out one more part of it and see how it works. Um, I, I think that White White would say that. Uh, um, in fact, in the book, there's a little anecdote where somebody says, "You know, um, White um, uh, action drives out planning," because uh, White was trying to get something done. In a, in a, in a, efficient, quick way. And, and White just said, I know it does. And, and he was very happy with that. But uh, I think melding the two, action and planning, um, and, and trying to prove to people that we can do two things at once may, may in a difficult situation like this, might be the way to go. OK. Um, I think you may have uh, addressed this a little bit in your previous answer. Uh, but Edward Acker asks, uh, how do today's concepts of placemaking correlate with White's ideas and vision? I think an amazing, I think a lot of them are right in line. I think that, um, if, if, if White were to show up on the scene today, I think he would be, um, I think he would be very heartened by a lot of, um, by a lot of the progress that's been made. Um, uh, he, he wouldn't be um, surprised at, at at the, at the sticking points, the, the concern about the movable chairs and so on, um, he would still be um, amazed and a little disappointed that that we still let cars um, dominate our um, urban landscape as much as we do. Um, but I think I think that a lot of the things that are happening are are influenced, and there's a lot of placemakers out there now who are. Um, who are well aware of William H. White and are carrying on the uh, crusade, if you will. The Project for Public Spaces continues to go on. Um, Fred Kent and his son Ethan have broken off on their own and, and are doing um, something called Placemaking X. And they're taking uh, some of the basic placemaking principles that, that uh, Fred learned with 
Holly White back in the in the 1970s as a member of the Street Life Project. Um, they're carrying that teaching far and wide, and uh, there's certainly a, a lot of people in the uh, in, in the architecture schools and so on who are who are aware of White. And I think I think more and more people are are catching on. So um, I, I think the movement continues, but it's a uh, it, it's ongoing, and uh, there are always going to be people out there who are going to want to. We had one in in Princeton uh, just a little while ago. Um, some restaurant moving from one location to another, and the town's not making them impose a minimum parking uh, requirement to go with it. Well, the restaurant would go out of business in this town if it if it, if it had to find a site with 50 parking spaces. So um, it's it's an ongoing ongoing struggle, ongoing process, but uh, but we're getting there. Okay, I guess here's a last question before we have a final wrap up question, which is, what do you think White would think of uh, the planning effort, planning's effort today to incorporate equity considerations into the planning practice? Well, he'd he'd be all for it for sure. Um, you know the, uh, the the fact that um, um, it would be a pretty dull city in, in White's mind if if if, um, if we sat around and and the only uh, and the whole and the whole community was made up of uh, you know affluent um, affluent white Starbucks oriented um, uh, people. Whose idea of a, of, a, of a public space is not a shopping mall, but it's, is to run and park their car in front of Starbucks, run in, say hi to a few people, and then run out and get in the car again. Um, uh, White would, would would find that um, disappointing, and I and I think again to go back to the social life of small urban spaces, it's, it was no accident that that, that he included that scene from uh, uh, 101st Street in East Harlem. Uh, there, there was there. There just is a wide range of humanity, and uh, and Holly White tried to embrace it all. Okay, thank you, Richard. As always, we could go on another twenty or thirty minutes just with the additional questions, but we'll need to wrap up here. And I guess in, in asking for your closing thoughts, uh, recognize that you're not a planner but a journalist, and you've been working on a, a planning topic here. And I'm curious what uh, kind of takeaways uh, as an observer and, and researcher of white in this history that, that you would have for us as planners, uh, given the work that he's done and where we are today. Yeah, I think that the, uh, the planning profession has a tough job and, and I've, I've gotten to see it a little bit from the, from the other side now, working with this uh, um, called Princeton Future, which is a advocacy group that tries to uh, Promote sustainable um, urbanism here in our in our town, and um, you, you you get to see the um, the incredible pressures on the planning department. Um, I would say that um, that the planners can can and should engage with the community a little bit more. I think the idea of of context that we talked about in the uh, um, in, in the presentation are are important. Um, Planners like to present their drawings and their, their, their schematics and, and so on, um, but I think um, getting out and being and being part of the community is is equally important, and it builds an incredible amount of of goodwill. Um, I showed that that slide of the uh, the street where the, everybody wanted to, everything to be on it, including a bike lane and way too much stuff. And the guy who was most credible at that presentation and that brought and that everybody from all sides of the conversation um, came together over it was a 20, I think, I think he said he was 28 years old, young, young urban planner, maybe the lowest guy on the totem pole in the planning office, I'm not sure. But he talked about that street and he said, I live on this street and I take my lunch there. And when I go up to the Chinese restaurant, I get a shrimp dumpling. And then to get over, to, I, I want to get a Mexican Coke. And to get that, I have to walk across the street. And so I know the intersection um, that you're all talking about. And I know the difficulties of designing that intersection. And I think people said, wow, here's a guy, he's one of us. And, uh, and, and I think that kind of credibility um, went a long way in, in that meeting. And I, I think in general, the fact that, that planners get out 
um, that, that, that our engineer showed up at the meeting with Jeff Speck and took an extra half hour, 45 minutes um, to go with him personally and a group of other town officials. Uh, I think that's, those are all examples of, of steps in the right direction. Great, thank you, Richard. And thanks for being with us today. Appreciate that. And as John Coleman sent out to the audience, uh, there are a couple of archive programs with Jeff Speck on Smart Growth Online and smartgrowth.org. With that, we're going to conclude our webinar today, American Urbanist, How William H. White Reshaped Public Life. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to Richard Ryan for a great presentation, to everyone who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru, who helps to make this all happen and keeps us on track. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those of you who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email if you need this certificate to claim other continuing education credits. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And finally, keep an eye on Smart Growth org and your email inbox for details on other future webinars including right of way addressing the epidemic of pedestrian deaths in america with angie schmidt which will be next tuesday we just posted another webinar on the website which uh, you'll get more information about and other programs are in the works so thank you for joining us today